and uh, I will. There we go. Recording has just been turned on. Um, just a reminder again to everyone that um, questions will be put in chat. Um, comments will not be read. Um, there's just not enough time with the number of people we have. Uh, the questions will be, and if we do not have time to answer them, we will uh, we will send answers afterwards. Okay, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Thank you very much. So I'm going to pass it over to Tyler Yakachuk, who's with Photan Planning, who's working on behalf of uh, for Osgood Properties, the the applicant. Go ahead, Tyler. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'd just like to introduce myself. I'm Tyler Yakachuk um, from Photan Planning, representing Osgood Properties. Um, and here on the team tonight is Rod Leahy um, from our design team, who will be discussing um, the design from RLA, um, as well as Jeff Karen from Osgood. And unfortunately, our um, transportation engineer uh, was unable to attend. He is sick. And I know there'll probably be a couple more questions about traffic in the comments. And while we may not be able to speak to them as authoritatively without the transportation engineer, we'll do our best. And if we can't resolve the question um, to your satisfaction, we will definitely do our best to um, get back to you with the more sufficient answer when, when we have consulted with um, the transportation team. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen and start presentation. Okay. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. Okay, so we are here today to talk about the proposed project at 1071 Ambleside Drive by Osgood Properties. The 30 story building being proposed is at the rear of the existing property where there's currently a parking lot indicated on the image here in orange. Uh, the pro proposed development is approximately 300 meters from the future New Orchard Transit Station and active transportation networks also make it an ideal location for intensification. The site is subject to the Clary and New Orchard Planning Site Specific Policy Area, which identifies the subject property in the apartment neighborhood this designation speaks to properties in the area with the intention to develop taller buildings with greater densities. Um, and as many of you are aware, the city is in the process of renewing its official plan, which includes reevaluating the goals of future development in Ottawa. However, other than changing the site specific policy area to a secondary plan, um, the new official plan will not change the policies affecting the site. Uh, with regarding to height, on this site, the policy states that the height is tied to the permitted height in the zoning, um, which brings us to our next slide. The site is presently zoned residential fifth density, subzone C, with a floor space index of three and a maximum building height of 39 meters, um, which typically maxes out at about 13 stories. Just to clarify, uh, floor space index or FSI is the maximum area that can be constructed on a property. Uh, it is calculated by dividing the total built up area on all floors of the building by the total area of the property. So for this property, the total built area cannot be greater than three times um, the area of the whole property, which is roughly 1.5 hectares or 160,000 square feet. Um, the zone permits a range of residential uses from townhouses to high rise buildings, as well as limited small scale commercial use. Um, that maximum FSI of three applies to the entire property and is thus shared between both the existing building and the proposed building. The subject property is surrounded by um, pro other properties that are zoned similar to itself, mainly varying in permitted heights. Uh, the permitted heights uh, transition downwards towards the lower residential heights uh, east of Byron Linear Park. To facilitate the development as proposed, Osgood Properties has made applications for both zoning bylaw amendments and an official plan amendment. Uh, these were necessary to permit the added height as proposed. However, beyond amending um, the permissible height, zoning with regard to uses and density will remain uh, as they presently are. In addition to the proposed building, there will also be added underground parking and improvements to the amenity space of the property. At the moment, a site plan application has not been applied for. 
this will be necessary in the future when the design layout has been finalized. And at the moment, the designs being presented here are concepts of what final designs will ultimately be projected in the future. Both the public and the city will have ample opportunity to let us know how the design can be further refined before we seek site plan approval. Uh, I will hand it off to the design team in a minute uh, to walk you through the concept plan that has been prepared in support of these applications, but I want to finish the project or with project statistics as they stand presently. The existing building on site is 13 stories tall and houses 252 residential units and includes 77 underground parking spaces. The proposed building has a height of 30 stories, including 293 residential units, and will provide over 5,000 square meters of amenity space. Combined, the properties will include 545 units, 444 underground parking spaces, 152 bicycle parking spaces, and will collectively have an FSI of roughly 2.61. I will now hand it over to the design team to walk you through their concept plan more fully and the methodology for how they arrived at their particular design. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Tyler. Again, my name is Rod Lai. Uh, we were hired by Oscar quite some time ago to analyze this site. I'm going to walk you through our presentation, so I'm going to uh, share my screen now. Can everybody see this? Uh, Teresa, good. All right, so I, I won't uh, walk you through the uh, uh, the site. Obviously, everybody knows where the site is. Um, this is just our our presentation, and some of this is a little bit of duplication. Um, uh, when when we are asked, the first thing we do when we look at sites like this is try to understand actually the nature of the site, the uh, the actual size of the site, the, the amount of development potential that's on the site, based on the current uh, zoning in terms of floor space index. And we also look at just the general nature of the site. I grew up in the West End. Uh, I know this site very well uh, through in high school. I had many friends whose families lived in actually these buildings. So I know the area quite well. Um, and so we were um, excited about the opportunity of what this site could be. Now, the first thing we do is we look at, um, we'll call these as a right options as a right means buildings you could do under the current zoning. Um, again, we're not asking for additional uh, building area. We're uh, asking for a redistribution of the proposed allowable density into a more palatable form. So we looked at this option, which is basically putting three buildings, three to 13 story buildings. Uh, Tyler mentioned we have a as a right uh, ability to put in a 13 story uh, buildings. And so we said, if we look at three buildings, uh, what sort of impact, and you can see on, on this upper image, um, how these buildings would fit in and the view from the water, uh, and just different area of the view. So we, you know, we study this, we look at an extreme case, which is the, uh, uh, and this is a view from the water, basically looking toward the site. Uh, an extreme example would be we remove the building at the front and we look at a long 13 story, what we would call traditionally a bar building that would go all the way across the back of the property. Again, these buildings are what's permitted under the current zoning bylaw. And in, in our opinion, we didn't think this was an appropriate way, obviously, to uh, develop the site, but it's good to always understand what could be done. So. Um, uh, we look at options to uh, improve that. Uh, this is again a view, you can see this, this approach would sort of block everybody's view, um, uh, obviously for the higher floors to get a view over top. Um, we don't think this is current, uh, in line with current um, uh, planning or uh, current design policies. So we began to look at different options to uh, look at um, taller buildings with um, a different um, uh, configuration. So this is what we call more like a bar building. Again, shifting the building all the way over to the um, uh, uh, west side of the property, opening up views to the river. And you can see the drawings down below showed how this building sits uh, in relationship to the existing buildings. 
uh, to the west as well as uh, the Osgood building, existing Osgood building. Option three was like a, a hockey stick uh, uh, option, basically, again, locating it in a way, trying to open up views for everybody. Uh, option four, again, was more of where we're sort of coming to in this design, where we came up with a, a more of a point tower building, uh, trying to locate it to open up views for the residents of both the subject property as well as the adjoining property. So we're looking at this from um, uh, um, both vantage points. Again, this is just more views. All these are just different views of uh, uh, we looked at to try to make sure we were trying to do something that opened up um, as many views as possible. This, this was a slightly smaller plate and maybe an addition onto the existing building. Uh, in the end, uh, we came to our uh, preferred option, which was a what we would call a point tower, which is essentially a center core plan with units all the way around. Um, it's the least impactful, in our opinion, from the existing uh, uh, neighborhood point of view. We've maximized tower separations uh, between the existing building and the proposed building. We're meeting all the uh, guidelines of the high-rise guidelines in terms of setbacks to property lines. And we think we've come up with an interesting alternative. The building uh, essentially functions as a, a building in a park approach, which is similar to the buildings that exist right now in this area. There's no podium. There's, it's a very simple building. It's just a, a tower of, uh, that comes right down to grade. It sits on top of a parking structure. Access now is a little different. Uh, under the original plan, the access came across the adjoining property and down into the underground parking. You can see the underlying how it, it went across through an easement and down to the underground. We've shifted that now, and this is basically just a drop-off point uh, here for uh, quick in and out deliveries. Um, and then all the major parking now is coming off of New Orchard. Uh, which um, simplifies from a traffic point of view and not putting people on the Amble side. Everything's on the New Orchard up to the intersection. And this leads you down into the underground parking garage. A lot of work has been done to make sure we green the site. So we've got large landscape areas uh, and future amenity areas. We're showing this is without sort of aid of landscape architect. Um, there could be programming where we could have everything from uh, tennis courts in here or badminton or any number of things could take place on this upper level. We've set back from the NCC along here with uh, landscape and we're looking at providing uh, connections through the site to possibly get access to the NCC. This obviously would be subject to discussions with the NCC. But you can see the uh, existing building has 252 units. We're proposing 293 for four sorry, 545 units. Um, and the square footage is actually still slightly less than what would be allowed under the current uh, zoning bylaw, actually substantially less than what could be allowed under the current bylaw. All of the underground parking, we're using a rate of 0.81 parking spaces per unit. They're all essentially located below grade with the exception of the small surface area parking that exists on the site today. Um, if I, so one of these things, one of the things we look at is uh, movement, pedestrian movement. We look at vehicular movement. So just the potential. When we first met with the city, there was a request that we looked at creating the site a little bit more permeable in terms of access to the NCC. And we do that too from the outside movement of people, as well as uh, within the building and through to the lower levels and out onto the NCC parkway. We we'll also uh, look at vehicular access, where we're coming as it's coming in underground. You can see this is the uh, the tower placement in this location. And this is amenities because of the grade change. We actually this is all glass here, looking onto the NCC Parkway with this potential opening here and through to um, to the green space uh, beyond. Uh, this is again just a simple diagram showing how the parking worked. I won't bore you with that. And this is the uh, uh, the act grade uh, plan showing landscape areas, amenity spaces. We are showing some units here, but I think by the time we finish, most of the ground floor would be 
dedicated for uh, amenity space. Um, this is what you would call a traditional point tower. You can see it's a, a relatively small plate. Unlike the bar building, it, it opens up views. That red corner is just the corner of the property line, just for a reference point. You can see all the units with the exception of the one unit at the back is sort of doesn't have the view of the water. The other ones all have views as well. We're conscious of views of the new residents as well as the old residents. And then we did some preliminary building elevations of sense of scale. So um, uh, this is, you can see the uh, Osgood building here and then the neighboring building uh, to, the, uh, to the west of the site. Um, just in terms of building section to see, you can see how the grading has worked, how we've got the raised ground area here. Um, this is the walkout amenity space to the NCC Parkway and then the three levels of underground parking. Uh, we did some preliminary perspectives, give a sense of scale to the site. So this is a view from the water and this is a view taken probably 13 stories up in the air. It's not really a human view, but uh, it helps describe um, the overall site. Uh, this is views from actually Ambleside looking through uh, the two buildings to the uh, building, uh, uh, proposed building. And this was that amenity space along the um, uh, uh, north face of the building. So this is actually the parking garage in behind all the amenity space uh, that's being provided here. Um, and with trying to create this animated and, and active, interesting um, connection through to the NCC uh, space. Uh, here we've placed the actual um, building into Google Earth just to get a little bit more of that sense of context. I think everybody is pretty clear on, on how this fits. And then the last, we of course do a series of, of um, uh, shadow studies and the city of Ottawa has mandated um, hourly um, studies from eight o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night on June 21st, as well as September 21st and uh, uh, through to December 21st. And uh, because we are on the, um, uh, Essentially, the north side, most of our shadows are directed north across the NCC properties, but um, I'll be happy to share these with people if they have a specific question that they want to see a specific site. Um, but uh, you can see shadows cast from, we, these programs cast shadow not from just our buildings, but, but from the adjoining buildings as well. So it gives a sense of, of uh, what the overall would look like with ours included. So um, that's really my presentation. I'm happy to go back to any part if there is some clarity so required. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Um, so if that is the end of the presentation, uh, we can go forward with the answering uh, questions, if that's all right. And like I said, if there's questions that are directed more to the city, we'll have city staff answer them. So um, I'll go back. Um, Connie can help me out. And uh, just a reminder, comments will not be read. Um, the first question was, um, why does the proposal deem the impact on proposed developments at 100 New Orchard to be insignificant regarding uh, vehicle congestion? Um, yeah. The September 2021 TIA is based on 216 city department data, yet the neighborhood uh, traffic condition has and continues to have significant evolved, has significantly evolved. Will Osgood agree to reassess traffic impacts calculations for New Orchard, Ambleside, McEwen Roads? Um, why does the proposed uh, it proposal ignore the uh, impact of the future development at 99 New Orchard and the corner of New Orchard and Richmond regarding vehicle congestion. Okay, uh, you don't have your traffic person here, um, but do you want to take a shot at it? Um, sure, just reviewing the TIA myself. Um, 
today and in preparation for this, looking at um, the findings, um, they are specifically asked by the city to speak to the traffic implications from the, the property in question right now. So it was with uh, beyond the scope for them to exactly look at um, developments that they were um, not privy to at the time. But that being said, if there are, there are further studies or further documentation or questions that we can perhaps um, levy to our transportation team, uh, we'd be certainly happy to look at what those impacts are um, in the future if we can get an answer. Uh, Lisa, you have your hand up. Lisa needs to be unmuted. Okay. Yeah, so apologies on behalf of Parsons. The person we had lined up, someone who wrote the TIA to be here, but he's suffering from a severe migraine and he did give us a bit of a briefing but said that he's able to sort of answer any questions and and through the process and Laurel, the city planner will probably get into this. We are still working on comments. We haven't received the first round of comments. So if there are concerns about the data used in the TIA and such, those are things that we will be able to correct and revise once we sort of get the comments from this meeting, plus um, anything that the city engineers potentially have seen looking at that report. Um, we, as, as sort of Tyler indicated, we are, we are still iteratively looking at this and um, some of the details such as traffic volumes and such, we're not at the site plan stage where there could be changes in the number of units, parking spaces and such. So that will get ironed out as the proposal moves forward. But anything you guys bring up today will definitely be captured. And when we respond to it in the resubmission portion, we will address what we can and have the transportation experts do that as well. Okay, thank you. Laurel, do you wanna add anything about uh, traffic studies overall? For the area? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Laurel McCrate. I'm a planner and development review West. I believe many of you have submitted comments to me that I will be summarizing and providing for 2410 um, so that they can respond to some of your comments. Regarding transportation studies, um, I don't have too much more to add unless there's specific questions. And we do have the transportation project manager on this file here from the city to answer um, any specific questions on behalf of the city. Um, I know some of you have mentioned the development at 100 New Orchard, and this development does have to account for any future developments that are on, uh, in stream right now. They have to account for their traffic total. So this one has accounted for that. Um, as for the one at the corner of New Orchard and Richmond, I don't know that there is a necessary, necessarily an active application there. Uh, right now? If so, I think it would be mine since I have most of them in this area. However, the applicants are responsible to account for any developments that are coming on stream, um, which I believe they've done uh, in this case. If there are other more specific questions, we can have uh, Patrick answer them, Councillor, but um, I think that's good uh, for now. Okay. Patrick, did you want to add anything since this is a big concern in terms of traffic? Uh, like Laurel, hi, I'm Patrick McMahon, the Transportation Project Manager. Like Laurel had pointed out, uh, this application does take into account the 100 New Orchard application. It did not meet the trip generation uh, trigger for the TIA. Therefore, it, it, was, it was not directly accounted for in this study. However, it is taken into account in the background, uh, background traffic. Okay, so it is taken into account. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a question about uh, if this session is being recorded. We've covered that. Yes, it is. And um, it will be viewed um, through the website and uh, it will be sent out uh, through the um, Bay Ward Bulletin that comes out every Friday, the newsletter. Thank you. Um, and um, we'll, ans we'll answer to any questions that are missed uh, for whatever reason be made available. Um, yes, but uh, perhaps not right away if they take a little longer. Um, we'll see what we can get done by by Friday, um, but um, we'll certainly do our best to, to get as much as we can. Um, will there be a vote on this? Um, 
Laurel, um, I did answer about planning committee and city council, but can you just elaborate a bit more for us, please? Sure, perhaps. Person. Maybe I could get in the screen here, sorry. Um, instead of doing next steps at the end, perhaps I'll do it now because that might uh, answer some people's anticipated questions. So do you mind, Councillor, if I kind of just do that really quickly sure. and then I won't have to do it at the end? So right now we are in the circulation process where the application is out for comments to internal and external agencies as well as members of the public. So right now I'm gathering comments internally from you know, Patrick for transportation, engineering, um, externally comments from the NCC, um, the, um, all the school boards and utility companies provide comments. I summarize those, I send them back to FO10 who then provides a response. Once I get a response, I will, I've started a notification list. I have over 200 of um, members of the public who have sent me comments either through email or um, letters that have been mailed to City Hall and I have received them. I'm not at City Hall myself, but those are sent to me electronically. And then I'll provide an update to everyone that a resubmission has been um, received. I'll let you know the high level changes, if any, that are made. And then it goes back out on uh, circulation for comments. So to make sure all of the, um, let's say for example, Patrick's comments have been addressed and we're satisfied. So the city goes back and forth with FO10 until we are satisfied and prepared to make a recommendation to planning committee. So because FO10 and Osgood Properties has applied for an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment, the ultimate decision lies with planning committee and council. So not with planning services, which is the department that I work in, we simply make a recommendation to planning committee and council on whether or not we recommend approval or refusal of the application. So the public meeting that will be considered planning committee, uh, I assume most likely it will be virtual. I can tell you right now, it's not gonna be January 27th. Um, there will be comments that FOTEN has to address. So it'll take a little bit longer and I will provide you ample opportunity to uh, notification to attend planning committee. Once we know um, a date for sure, I'll send out an email to everybody. If, you've no, if you have sent your comments to me, you will receive a notification from the department 10 days prior to planning committee with the department's recommendation as well as instructions on how to participate at planning committee. So everyone is welcome to come. If you would like to make a presentation orally, um, you, have, you have to sign up and you have five minutes in which to speak to the committee. The committee will decide on the spot whether or not to accept the department's recommendation and then the application rises to council um, at the next council meeting. So council can decide to either uphold planning committee's recommendation or um, vote differently. It all, it all depends. So planning services makes a recommendation and it is up to planning committee and council to, to make the decision. So we won't be going January 27th. I'll keep you um, updated as best as I can once I have an idea of when the application will proceed. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and we may get some questions out of that, but I'm going to read the questions as fast as I can. Um, of course, there's a couple of questions here regarding the, the loss of view and loss of privacy and um, whether this has been taken into consideration. Um. I, I can answer that. I think we spent a significant amount of time actually um, studying that, that and not only, obviously not only just from the residents uh, of uh, the subject property, but the adjacent residents as well. That's why we came up with what we consider this point tower to allow, there are views, guarantee people are losing part of their view. I don't think everybody or people are losing all of their view. It's a part of their view that's being lost. And our, our goal was to minimize the um, impact. So, um, and again, uh, from a privacy point of view, as I mentioned, we only have one unit really that's looking um, back toward the uh, Ambleside Drive. Everywhere else is moving their views outward. So, and again, we've got, a substantial different um, um, separation distance between the um, the buildings that minimizes that sort of loss of privacy. Okay, thank you, Rod. Um, the Cleary and New Orchard area specific policy provides that on lots greater than a thousand square meters, 
abutting on NCC lands, the basis of any design is two to four uh, story building frame. The NCC corridor have ground units facing the open space corridor and active entrances um, and transparent windows facing the open space. Please explain why your proposal does not meet any of these criteria. Uh, well, as I, I mentioned in the sort of preamble, we, we looked at a ways to um, redistribute the density in a way that we thought was better as an overall um, design for the subject property. And uh, we looked at, you know, everything has changed with the, uh, the advent of the LRT and, and the goal to not only, this is not really increasing density, it's, it's just taking the allowable density and put it into a, a better built form. So all of these sites, uh, where most sites in the city of Ottawa have um, permitted zoning and that zoning overrides all official plan and all secondary plan. So the zoning allows for, as I said, 13 story building that stretches across the entire property length at the back. Uh, we don't think that's an appropriate way to develop, but that is actually, that zoning uh, supersedes um, all official plan documentation. So we think this is just a better way to, to develop the site than what's allowed under the current zoning. Thank you. Is a pool still considered, being considered? Uh, yes, we had a, a possibly an outdoor pool and we're looking at an indoor pool as well, but um, we're really, a long way away from getting into uh, 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 getting into uh, that sort of level of design, but we have space for both. Um, but right now we've got um, the, you know we've got so much to get through um, that whether or not a pool is in there or not is not really that important at this stage. So, okay, um, ongoing access to the CC property um, will it be? Uh, for for those in Ambleside One, is there any um, uh, consequences on your project on this? I didn't introduce myself at the beginning. I'm Lisa Della Rosa, and I'm with Go Ten as well. With regards to the NCC, we are exploring the option of connecting. Um, we think it's beneficial to this project, but there's a process that we have to sort of go through with them and a separate approval. So the idea of a connection is is something we'd like to see, but we won't have the, we can't tell you right now that is something that we're gonna be able to work out. With regards to the connection between Ambleside One and this project, um, I don't believe there's any indication that we're fencing it and creating some sort of blocked access where this site is separate. But again, that comes down to our site planning process, which we are not in yet. And that process is public as well. So once a site plan goes in where the details such as the swimming pool, the more, more connection related bike lane, sidewalks, accesses, building materials, all of that is a separate planning process, which we haven't started yet. Um, and when they do, again, that process is public and notification will be put up on site where additional comments can be brought in. And that's where we're, we're in the more finer details of how the site actually is laid out and operates. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, from Howard, um, why does the developer need to push the envelope on the existing zoning planning constraints? Um, what is the rationale? Well, I think Rod, you, you were uh, trying to make a case on that, but do you want to reiterate? Just uh, again, we if, if we look at um, what potentially could be um, developed on the site, we think this is a better approach than the 13 story buildings that either, I showed one example of um, three buildings, there are three 13 story buildings or one very large long building. We just don't think that in the current, sort of design philosophy of high rise buildings, that's an appropriate way to do it. And so we've elected to um, not increase density. In fact, we're not matching the potential density. It's really just uh, taking the density into a higher form. And in so doing, we reduce the impact, uh, uh, the visual impact on the adjacent uh, neighbors uh, and residents within the subject property. Thank you. What are the planned amenities? Oh, uh, <laughs> again, I, I can only speak strictly, but 
we've got um, everything from um, uh, 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 gyms, obviously. We do uh, 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 common uh, rooms for, uh, for party rooms. Uh, we do demonstration kitchen areas. Um, we do uh, uh, health clubs. Um, so any number of things. One of the things feature now, we're, because of, uh, again, we've learned a lot through the COVID, we do uh, uh, business centers within the uh, facility to allow people to have uh, meetings. For example, a lot of work from home now. Uh, and so it allows somebody to come downstairs to have a structured area that could be a boardroom meeting, internet connection, small desk areas that people can use to uh, get away from, if they're in a one bedroom uh, apartment, to get away from the space to go downstairs and have more of an office atmosphere. So all of these things were beginning to integrate into uh, rental buildings like this. So. Hey, thank you. Has an ecological assessment been done in terms of the effect of this building on um, uh, concerning traffic and construction as well? Uh, well, the traffic study, I think, is being done. I'm not sure the ecological effect on traffic. On the construction itself, the, uh, you know, we go through a, a phase one study and a phase two study from an environmental point of view. Uh, and we'll also do, as part of the process, wind studies as well as the... Uh, and so um, through that process, we'll highlight any sort of, um, sort of adverse impacts on the uh, current uh, environment. Okay. Has been an environmental site assessment done, which essentially looks at sort of potential contaminated soils and such. Um, we also have a geotechnical study that looks at the stability of the ground and the ability for the existing um, situation to support construction such as this. And that's currently in with the city as part of the submission package. Um, with regards to like environmental impacts such as waterways or uh, species at risk and stuff, the screening with the city indicated that there was no concerns at this point. And so there wasn't a fulsome environmental report when you talk about the birds, the bunnies, the bees, that sort of stuff. But we do have the environmental site assessment that deals more with potential contamination sources and such. Um, and so that's currently in with the city as well. And there's been no indication that there's anything of concern, either from oh. a geotechnical perspective or an environmental contamination point of view. Yeah, the subject area of this development is essentially a large surface parking lot. So it's not greenfield development in, in the way it's deserving. So it's. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm going to think that they meant the standards, the, um, your environmental standards in terms of the quality of the building and. Um, impact on the environment? Yes, yeah, so again, fairly early on, and that's, you know, a meeting as we move through this process, we'll begin looking at alternate um, uh, heating sources, uh, environment, the, uh, the qualitative aspects of the building skin, window design, we do, uh, the city has implemented uh, bird-friendly uh, glazing, we'll be obviously putting that into our building, so, um, We'll have uh, large areas for um, 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 bicycle storage rooms. And, and I imagine we'll be outfitting the proposed building with uh, bicycle storage for the existing residents as well. I, I doubt if they exist right now in the building, I'm not sure. But so those are the things that we, you know, we'll bring the, the project sort of uh, a higher standard than what's there today. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna read this question. Um, it says, what would it take to stop this? And um, um, and you're asking, um, would this, how is this project accepted or rejected? And um, Laurel has already described that it goes to planning committee. That's where it goes and that's where it's voted on. So it's voted on by um, members of council. I don't happen to be one of them. Um, I get my vote at council. So, so that's why it gets voted on, just so everyone's clear. Um, uh, petitions, um, uh, might influence those who are voting, but there is not a process to stop the development in terms of petition. And I know that that question has come up. Okay, I'll read on to the next question. Um, 
Penny is asking, uh, Tyler says the structure is 300 meters from the LRT station, yet the photon proposal says 150 meters, which is correct. Um, I believe it is, I will double check the rationale, but I'm quite confident it is 300 meters um, as presented in the presentation this, uh, this evening. But if you- Versus a walking distance to transit versus a bird's eye view from transit, but we can confirm that. Okay, thank you. Um, please explain Hi, I'm why- I'm sorry to interrupt, this is Connie. Lisa, if you could, uh, when you speak, there many people have a lot of trouble understanding if you could get closer to your microphone when you speak, Lisa. Yeah, I've been having issues all day. I'll get really close. I'll just turn off my camera so you're not staring at my eyeballs. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, um, uh, we're not going to take questions. Um, so hands up, we'll not, um, we will not be doing that. Um, we're using the, um, the chat function because of the time that we have and to get through all the questions. Thank you for your consideration. Um, so please explain why Parsons TIA um, claims the addition of 363 vehicles will have a negligible impact on the congestion and safety of New Orchard Avenue. Um, that is a question that will probably require um, further looking into through our um, transportation engineer. Um, but just looking at the TIA, it suggests that uh, the max um, capacity, or sorry, the max amount of vehicles through the intersection at Ambleside and New Orchard will be 50 per hour, which they have suggested is um, a doable amount. So at least for my um, non-expertise situation reading this, I would believe that they've undertaken it to be estimated that it would be um, an appropriate level of traffic, even with the new development. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna read Jennifer's question about um, keeping her small children and others safe from increased traffic is, um, would there be any measures to keep people safe in terms of pedestrians? Uh, sorry, is that during construction or after? I think during? that means in the permanent state, but mm -hmm. during construction, of course, is important as well. Yeah, so during construction, obviously there's safety plans and, and construction plans registered with the city. After construction, I think part of the site plan process I think a lot of that will be discussed in terms of, you know, does it require sidewalks of taking a stream or, or, you know, so I think there'll be a lot of issues that will be dealt with through the site plan process uh, on, on um, safety issues with regards to pedestrian traffic, so. Okay, and obviously the city will, will be uh, examining that as well. Yeah. Um, okay, um, is it a done deal? No, it's, no. Uh, as I explained, it, it is voted on by the planning committee uh, with 10 members and that at city hall, and then it is voted on at, uh, at the city council. So that is where the voting happens and um, plans uh, do get rejected and accepted there. And um, so it's, it's uh, that's, that's where it happens. Uh, was it considered to replace the derelict 13 story at the front of the property or is that phase two of the project? No, I, I you know, I actually asked the client that that exact question. Is it something because, you know, that could have impact on the phase one? And he said, absolutely not. There's um, uh, no thought of, uh, of uh, tearing down this building. There's too much value in it, essentially. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The um, from Penny, um, the proposed the proposal notes um, notes. Uh, pardon me. The proposal notes there is a problem with stormwater in the neighborhood, but de uh, but details on stormwater design will only be provided in the site plan control uh, application. Will Osgood delay the project until the city is satisfied with all the problems relating to stormwater? In the, in the neighborhood are resolved? I think that's more of a Laurel question. 
Sure. So for the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment, the study that's required is adequacy of services. So the city would like to ensure based on intensification on the site with the increased density and number of residents, we'd like to ensure that there is sufficient capacity for storm, uh, drinking water and sanitary. Um, do we necessarily look at if there's issues in the area regarding storm? Yes, so we have professionals in the, um, not necessarily in planning services, but um, departments across the city, all engineers who will take a look at the studies, but the nitty gritty details of how storm will, stormwater would be controlled would be a issue that we look at at site plan. Right now we're concerned to make sure there's enough capacity that can serve the proposed development. Okay, thank you. Um, how will you identify the two buildings as both buildings are currently addressed as 1071 Ambleside Drive in the plans? I'll take that one. Uh, should this build uh, proposal receive approval, it will be readdressed to have a, a different address. So that's done through the city, through our addressing and sign. Thank you. Will there be a facelift for the existing buildings, such as the entrance overhang? Uh, I, I think that's, um, I don't know if Jeff wants to answer that or or it, it's not really part of this application at this time, so. Yeah, maybe I could take uh, a stab at answering that. Hi, I'm everybody, I'm Jeff Karen, I represent Osgood here. Um, you know, we we try to take best care of our, our buildings um, independently and we'll continue to do that and, and look at those buildings separate from development opportunities. But we recognize also that having a total offering, a uh, brand new offering and a, and a good looking building beside it, it is really valuable and really important. So we'll absolutely you know, look to make sure that both buildings look their best as we go forward if this, uh, if this proposal is accepted. Thank you. Um, what is the long-term plan for the site? Uh, basically asking our, um, are there going to be more towers? No, this is basically a max out the development potential on this site at this point. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, how will cycling safety be addressed? Uh, again, I think through the site plan process, um, the city has a, a, a review process uh, with specifics to cycling. Um, we are providing you know, on-site cycling facilities, uh, proper storage with easy access. Basically, the riders can ride right down into the lower parking garage uh, directly off of uh, uh, New Orchard. And uh, we have uh, facilities there, secured facilities, as well as you know, tune-up rooms and everything else. So, uh, but the city will look at the longer range of, of bicycling access. There is um, access directly from New Orchard through into the NCC uh, trail system. So, okay, thank you. Um, the question in regards to a petition and. Um, would City Hall stop a project in light of a, a petition by 400 with 400 signatures? The, the short answer is um, not necessarily. Um, again, it is voted on at planning committee by uh, members of city council, my colleagues. And um, if this influences them, then obviously that changes their vote. Um, you can write to them, you can tell them how much you're concerned about it. I certainly will be talking to them. I already have actually. I've already reached out to the chair, um, so uh, to let them know about the, the 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 concerns in this in this community. So so that so that is the answer to that. Thank you, um, Osgood. Uh, okay, is this a question here? Okay, um, we'll move on to a question. Um, uh, the question about uh, increase in vehicle traffic and foot traffic with the size of the building, has that been taken into consideration? Uh, I believe we've answered that um, with, um, with the concerns, but um, there will be more, uh, I think we'll hear more about that uh, later because unfortunately the traffic um, expert for FOTAN could not come. Okay. Um, 
we're going to uh, the question about demolishing the existing building. Well, we've already established that it's not going to be demolished. Um, does the city regulate traffic during construction? The answer is yes. Um, Laurel, do you want to detail that, or is, or, is, or Patrick would be the best to deal to detail how traffic is regulated during construction? Uh, yep, the city does regulate it. We also require applicants to have traffic management plans so that when they are um, in the construction phase, we know how they plan to stage the site. Um, maybe not so much for this one, sites that are on, let's say, busier roads such as Richmond or Carling, where it is tight for staging, we need to know uh, where they are going to be staging for construction. So how, um, if and when traffic plans to be stopped, the times of construction, if there's any detours required, if cycling facilities or sidewalks are to be closed so that we can plan accordingly um, and reroute where necessary. So we um, try to work with the applicant as early as possible to have these plans in place so that when it comes time for construction, uh, things can go as smoothly as possible. Thank you. Um, uh, do I understand that the zoning amendment is uh, requesting double the number of stories from the existing 15? Uh, yes, um, and um, I believe Rod explained the rationale in terms of if they did by what they are allowed in zoning, they could build three buildings, mm -hmm. so of uh, 15 stories. So, so that was his response to that. Um, what is the city's decision-making criteria for accepting or denying the application to increase height restrictions to more than double of the, of the current bylaw? What are the most important deciding factors? Um, well, um, I'm gonna send that to Laurel because she's the one who writes the recommendation in terms of based on what she's heard um, and um, all the, the questions you've asked, like um, in terms of the, the top concerns the city has. So essentially the simple answer is the department's recommendation boils down to how the proposal aligns with city policies that are passed by city council. So this application was submitted under, I don't want to say the current official plan, the official plan that was in effect before, um, let's say November, before October. So the one from earlier 2020, 2021. Um, so I take a look at all the policies in there. So specifically, you guys have mentioned the Cleary and Orchard secondary plan. I have to review the proposal um, in line with the Clearing New Orchard secondary plan. So there's specific policies in there regarding design. There's policies regarding height and density redistribution. And then I'd also be looking at policies in the broader official plan in terms of urban design. So does it meet tower separation? Um, there's a whole, there's a there's many policies in the official plan that we have to look at. If we feel that the policies align with the proposal, then we would move forward with an approval. If we feel that you know the proposal is completely out of line with our policies, then we would recommend a refusal. So I have to take a look at you know the Planning Act, the Provincial Policy Statement. That is a um, broader policy document that is with the entire province of Ontario, as well as the city's official plan and any design guidelines that would pertain to this proposal. So it's basically all policy. It's not just how I'm feeling and whether I think this is a great you know, proposal or not. That's not exactly how I we no. planners do their jobs. We have to rely on all the policies. So a lot of the times our hands are, our hands are tied. If the policies say, you know, this is an appropriate form of de development then that's how we would have to proceed. Thank you. Um, why does the city have zoning bylaws if every developer asks and usually gets exceptions? So that also relates back to the Ontario Planning Act. Under the Planning Act, which is um, a document that guides development throughout the whole province, it, it states that anyone is any property owner or non property owner is able to apply for a zoning bylaw amendment as they see fit. So anyone can come in and ask to have their property or their neighbor's property rezoned to what they deem as appropriate. And then it's evaluated by the municipality and ultimately planning committee and council. If we were just to apply all the zoning bylaws, I should also state, not necessarily for this property, but our bylaws is very outdated. It's an amalgamation of all the previous municipalities into one 
massive obese bylaw that is not up to date. It doesn't meet a lot of the policies in our old and new official plan. And we're going to be going through a massive review to redo our um, zoning bylaws. So a lot of the requests we see today are simply requests um, because the zoning on current properties are out of date for current times. So anyone is allowed to apply for a zoning amendment, that's their right under the Planning Act. Whether it is appropriate or not, I should say, you have the right to apply. Thank you, Laurel. Um, why does developer need to provide so much parking when LRT is next door? Um, how are we gonna get cars off the road? Um, I'm just gonna uh, um, ask Rod about the parking ratio um, overall, just to let people know that um, how many people will get parking spots. So currently we analyzed the existing uh, project, uh, the existing site, and it was working at around a 0.8 uh, parking spaces per existing um, uh, tenancy, and, and that's the target we're going for now. Um, uh, so it's substantially lower than what could be asked for, but slightly higher than uh, minimum standards. I think in this area, the minimum would be a 0.5 plus 0.1. So we're slightly higher than that at 0.8, I think 0.81, I think something like that. So, um, uh, and uh, I guess it's a lot of that is just based on sort of existing conditions and then looking at some of the newer projects that are being built along the LRT line further outside, further east of the city. You know, we don't have many further west of the city just yet. So we're looking at those numbers and that seems to be in line with the projects like at Blair Road, for example, so. So, so that means 20% do not have parking spots, correct? So, well, remember there's a 10% a, a in there of visitor parking that is in right. that point eight. So we have 30% do not have parking 30, spaces. 30% yeah. do not have a parking spot. Um, yeah. I don't know how that compares to the ample sites. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if the, everyone gets parking spots, so a little different. So this is what's happening going forward is uh, you don't automatically get parking spots, just so people realize that in the time yeah. when ample sites were built, um, I expect that it was 100%, if not more, in, in case people had more cars. I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, yeah. I'd have to check it, but um, not, uh, not sure if you know. No, we actually looked, I think there was one-to-one -one parking, but we actually went through and examined the actual the rental uptake and it was actually lower than um, what was on site. There were vacant parking spaces on site. Uh, mm -hmm. People are choosing now not, you know, cars are, as you know, very expensive. And people, uh, there are people choosing not to own cars. So, uh, and I think uh, and we're hoping obviously with the investment in LRT that there'll be more people choosing not to own cars. So. Thank you. Okay, um, there's a question about emergency vehicles. How will an ambulance get through the long term to the long term care home across the street during construction? Um, that might be a Patrick question in terms of uh, traffic control and, con and during construction. As uh, Laurel pointed out, there will be a uh, traffic uh, management plan that will be implemented at if and when this development proposal does get accepted at that point, we'll, uh, we'll make sure that everything is accommodated uh, appropriately as I pointed out earlier. Okay, thank you. Um, how does this building design align with the city's official plan that professes to identify and protect natural features, um, enhance green space visibility and access to these spaces? Uh, do you wanna take that Rod? Um, well, I could in, in, in saying we're, this is a unique situation in that we're actually um, building, as I mentioned, we're building on top of a parking lot. So there are real, no natural um, uh, environment that we're disturbing. We're, we're basically, in our opinion, we're um, removing a parking lot, putting up a, a quality building with and enhancing the landscaping in the uh, on site and the immediate uh, uh, area. So uh, we'll have uh, increased landscape uh, a buffer along the entire length of the uh, NCC, which can be a, a parkway and it can be planted and increase the landscaping area. I think one of my renderings showed that space. So it's about a 20 foot uh, 
in uh, landscape space along the entire length of the property. So we feel comfortably we're actually increasing the amount of um, natural vegetation on the site from what exists today. Thank you. Tracy's asking you, Rod, uh, what was the design brief uh, that you received um, and targets that Osgood wanted to hit with this proposed design? It would seem that your other options proposed would keep legacy, legacy residents and views more intact than the current proposal. Could you please clarify the brief you received? Well, the, the brief was fairly open-ended actually. Uh, we met with Mr. Greenberg and he asked me to take a look at this site and give me my professional opinion on how this site could be developed. And so, again, as I mentioned, we looked at existing zoning and reported to him what the actual zoning that's in place today would allow him to build in terms of location of buildings and the amount of square footage that's permitted. And then he asked, well, how would we build that in a way that would have least impact? He's obviously very concerned about impact on his building as well as the adjacent property owners. And so um, we, we looked at different options and we came up with this solution, but there was no real design brief. It was really a, generally Osgood is more into management as opposed to building. They, they've got a huge history of purchasing buildings and managing them. Um, uh, not as much history in, in starting and, and building from scratch. So this was a, a, a fairly new uh, project for uh, Osgood and uh, and so we sort of walked, we went through this whole process on, on how they could develop this site. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Irene's asking about um, our policies of develop, um, what is the point of having policies if developers can request amendments? How are citizens supposed to make the important life decisions such as purchasing properties such as Ambleside One when they cannot rely on city policies to be consistent applied? Um, well, I guess that's an interpretation issue. Um, Laurel, can I uh, let you take a crack at, um, at that? I, I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it's kind of difficult to answer. Yes, we need to have these policies to set, you know, parameters in which you know, we are developed, but we are a city that's looking to grow. We're a mid-sized city that needs to see intensification. And, you know, we need to see proper intensification in the right spots um, and how it will look. I basically wouldn't have a job though, if uh, we didn't have developers come in with applications, whether or not they support, you know, they meet the policies. We, we have to have some parameters in which to measure things against. Um, I don't really have a good answer, Irene. Thanks a lot, Councillor. I don't really have a good answer for you. It, no, I, it, it's it's uh, it was not fair to do that to Laurel. That's Just, okay. <laughs> but it's more about the um, you know what is the point of having policies? Well, the the point of having policies is you do have to have guidelines. Um, what has happened here is uh, there, as uh, Laurel pointed out earlier, um, is that any developer can come and challenge them. Um, it's it's trying to weigh the pros and cons. And obviously, um, Irene, it's a big con on your side um, in terms of what's happened because I don't think anyone expected a parking lot to become a 30-story building. That's pretty clear. Um, but uh, what was pointed out is that if they have right, if they did not get their um, zoning amendment to have 30 stories, they could go ahead and build three 15-story buildings without asking us because it's already in current policy. I think that's what was being pointed out. Would that help? Uh, it would still block views. It would still um, be an issue. So, so those are the, the different pros and cons here. Thank you, Irene. Um, is indoor parking uh, going to be fairly distributed between the two buildings or will be the new, presumably more expensive building get first priori priority? Um, there has not been even slightly enough indoor parking for Parkwood Towers, I guess this is somebody who lives here, who waited three years for a spot. Um, so um, can you um, talk about how that's going to be done with the old building? Uh, Those I, sort of details are, we're still working on unit counts and Ron had sort of 
alluded to the fact that we're still looking at the size of units, what the rents are going to be, how many parking spaces, whether or not it's a, the, the buildings themselves will not be joined. So mm -hmm. it's unlikely that will there be extra parking spaces potentially, but is it a likelihood that the people from existing Ambleside will be located in the new building for parking? Mm -hmm. It's hard to say, um, but those are sort of details as we go through the process and figure out when this building is being built. I think there was a comment regarding timing. Um, construction is, is slated for 2023 potentially. <laughs> Uh, depending on the approval timeline and, and such. So there's still a ways to go before things start happening on site, obviously. Um, and as we said, the parking rates and who gets what is still, that's closer to the end of the, the process. Sorry, sorry, I'm just gonna correct Lisa. Sorry. Just, just a little bit. <clears throat> well, at least you can hear me. Yeah, so, so the goal is we, we will be ensuring that all of the parking spaces that were basically taken away from the building are, are replaced within the building. And there is a connection from the uh, proposed new parking garage into the building, the existing building. And so um, there, there will be uh, new underground parking for the existing residents. Uh, uh, the, the share of which still to be decided, but I'm sure it's going to be fairly evenly distributed uh, between the, uh, um, the two buildings. Uh, uh, but that, that will come through, but th there will be, we're not basically removing all of the surface parking lot and only putting parking for uh, the proposed building. So we're replacing the lost parking as well as the, uh, as well as providing for the new parking. Thank you. Uh, are you going, um, Jennifer's question is about being compensated um, for loss of uh, value due to future drops in sale price uh, when their view is blocked. Uh, Jennifer, um, it, you will not be. <laughs> I, it's, it's, uh, I know this is hard and I know there's a lot of anger, um, but um, this is, um, this is about uh, whether this project goes ahead or not. And um, in terms of uh, the views and, and uh, the concerns on that, um, that's definitely a factor. And it's one that I raised right to, um, to the manager of, uh, of, of development for the city uh, on, in terms of, uh, can this be considered a, a concern? So, um, so it, has been, it has been raised. And um, one thing I can say is that with the values in Ottawa, the fact that um, it's uh, very difficult to, to, um, to get accommodation um, and prices are going up, uh, most places will continue to rise in value regardless. This is what is happening right now. So um, um, that's the reason why we need intensification is because we do not have enough properties. We do not have enough places for people to live. This is going to be a building that is rental and your place is a, is a condominium. But um, um, it's uh, the way the, it is going. Um, the reason that uh, developers want to come to the neighborhood to build is because of the lack of accommodation and um, which of course makes the prices rise. And, and that's the, what is happening right now. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm looking here for questions. Uh, fire code, every building in the neighborhood has multiple emergency exits and crews. The proposed building has only one access, especially leaving on the north side. Um, is this a problem? Is this gonna be a problem? Uh, I think no, I, I, I believe our building meets the requirements of the um, Ontario Building Code, uh, that the building will be reviewed, I think, by the uh, fire department. But our access, I'm comfortable with our access meeting the code. Okay, and of course, that is a criteria that must be met. Yes. Um, how will the building be heated and cooled? Um, that's subject to discussion, but uh, there's multiple, uh, either through uh, uh, 
multiple four pipe fan coil systems or heat pumps or uh, ground source heat pumps. So we're looking at, uh, we will be looking at all the different alternatives uh, as we move this forward, but um, it would be through some form of central system. Okay, I'm going to read this one um, about the images of underground parking show that it stretches much wider than the tower itself. Um, where will uh, runoff water go, uh, which presently might run on, under the surface lot? Uh, why are more parking spaces needed underground than the number of units in the tower plus surface spaces? Okay, so, well, uh, groundwater is basically will be contained. Now we have a very large roof deck over top of the entire parking garage. So we will have roof drains that will collect all the uh, uh, storm water. And then they basically, the roof drains then funnel into a, a cistern, which is then has a controlled flow out to the um, uh, uh, storm system. So that's part of the future design that we'll get into through the site plan process. And the reason why we have more parking spaces than units is because again, what I mentioned, we're we're adding in the units, the parking spaces that were lost of the existing parking spaces um, that are now being built over. So we're, we're putting in the parking that once was there as well as parking for the new building. Thank you. Um, Patrick, um, is there an analysis on the um, Richmond New Orchard traffic um, with the simultaneous construction of LRT and the LRT station Ambleside development? The construction is not taken into account in a transportation impact assessment that is that is for the existing as well as future conditions. The impact of construction would be more contained within the traffic management plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, the common room in the current building on the site is a room in the basement that's, cl that's closed except for a short time in the morning and afternoon. Will the new amenities be similarly closed to tenants? I mean, I think you mean the tenants in the existing building? Yes, I think that's a management question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, can, I can take a shot at that. We've got Steve here. Do you want to jump on yeah. Steve? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Hi, I'm, I'm Steve Greenberg. I'm the president of Osgood. Uh, a lot of the reason for uh, the public space in the uh, existing building, 1071 Ambleside, uh, no, unfortunately, you looking it, up for the alarm? yeah, I'll be fine. Thanks. Okay, thanks. It, night. Is, is due to COVID. Uh, the intention uh, would be to have the, those public spaces open um, at all times uh, during the day and, and early evening, and and that's what we would see uh, both at 1071 after uh, COVID is hopefully finished and in the new proposed building. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for coming out, Steve. Um, okay, I'm reading all questions. Has the uh, socioeconomic impact of people selling their properties in neighboring buildings due to loss of view, construction impact, et cetera, been studied? Will this create a change in the current demographic of the area? Um, it's uh, likely that uh, it will not uh, be studied except in the terms of that um, these things are noticed in terms of uh, changes in the community, but um, it, it's really hard to tell. And, it, and um, of course, you're, you're, uh, it, in the end, is there going to be um, a lot of movement? I, I can't tell you, um, but uh, in terms of the demographics, um, I, it, that's a very difficult question to know until it actually happens, I guess, um, if you're saying that, um, these things would happen. Um, did I okay. Um, at which level, uh, financial level, would the rent start for the proposed building? I, I'm not sure if Steve wants to add, answer yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Sorry, I'm just just trying to work my uh, my mute button. We haven't uh, determined as yet um, until such time as we do our market studies and our and our specific unit count 
how exactly we want to position this building. Uh, I can tell you that we are looking into CMHC's um, uh, affordable uh, program, but uh, we're probably a good uh, six months to a year away from having a final determination as to exactly where we want to position this building and what the target rents will be. Okay, thank you. Steve, now I'm just going to elaborate on that because I raised that when I met with uh, with your um, with Fotan and uh, representatives um, about affordable housing. And um, so people know that the way it works for affordable housing is CMHC is the one who makes a determination of uh, the rent uh, by um, ensuring that a certain number of units, uh, which is decided between the city and the developer um, are deemed to be affordable, therefore uh, more affordable, obviously, than um, the rest of the units. So um, this has been done at other projects that um, have happened in Bay Ward. We had 45 units in Bayshore um, deemed to be affordable. So, and uh, it's based on a formula that it can't, uh, the rent can't exceed 30% of, of an average income for the city of Ottawa, which is, uh, it's not deep, deep affordable. This is affordable. These are working people affordable. So just so that people understand that, uh, what that means and what that definition is. Okay. Um, okay, I lost my place. Um, uh, there's a question about uh, late afternoon, evening setting sun um, and the consideration. I think that is implying about um, the uh, shadows. Um, and, um, and how that affects the neighboring buildings. We do have shadow studies. The city uh, ordered them and uh, they do on all tall buildings, all buildings actually. Um, and Rod was showing us diagrams of that and that is included in the package. So um, Rod, just to clarify, we will be um, uh, getting a copy of your presentation to um, post as well. Yes, I, I believe it's online right now. Uh... Uh, Laura can speak to that. Okay. And, and I'm happy to have, I mean, it's very hard to see these shadow studies. Uh, Teresa, if you want, I can have some sent over specific times of day even. Uh, if, if there are specific requests with people who want to know what it's like at four o'clock in the afternoon on June 21st, we have that information. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm sure that that will be requested. So I'm sure I'll hear uh, uh, request for that. Um, has a environmental impact assessment been done? Uh, yes, I believe Lisa answered that. Yes, it has. Thank you. Um, and yes, that's standard that that needs to be done on, on projects like this. Um, does this have to be a, a luxury apartment? Um, uh, is it, I guess that's the question, is this going to be a luxury apartment um, or is it uh, because rent is already expensive in this area? Uh, well, as I, as I said before, we are not uh, certain as to how we're going to position this building and what the availability of, of various programs is. Um, what I can tell you is with the um, cost of construction escalating the way it has and interest rates uh, increasing as well, that it's very difficult. Uh, well, in, in fact, it's impossible to build an apartment building um, and do it uh, and, and charge rents uh, that are significantly below market without uh, government subvention. Okay, thank you. Uh, Teresa, I, I just yes. noticed in the chat popped up and the question that was asked about the shadow study was actually a reverse study was uh, uh, glare. Um, oh, I, right, you're right. Yeah. And so, uh, and you know, it's an interesting question and I, I, I actually never modeled that. I'm not even sure if my computer could model it, but um, so if you give me a chance, I, I can try to get back to you on whether or not that's even possible to do. Uh, okay. uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I read it. Too Shadows are relatively easy. That the reverse is probably a lot more difficult because it would yeah. depend on the obviously depend on the person viewing it and time of day and so many different angles would be involved. So I'm not sure if it's even possible to do. So 
Okay, thank you. Apologies, Andrea. Um, uh, so I could have, we do not use mirrored glass, okay? If that, so, you know, the old days of the mirrored glass is, is gone. It's, it's uh, I think, almost prohibited now, basically. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, are the, um, is the environmental impact screening document a public document? Uh, yes, that's available on the dev apps search. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Um, and soil assessment, et cetera, as well? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, um, there's a question about wind study and will the, will the city do its own study to validate findings of the wind study that was done? Um, no, we will not go out and do our own separate study. We will review the wind study with our experts in house. If we were to go do our own study for every application, um, it's, it's not a realistic ask. The amount of applications that the department sees, you know, across the city, um, specifically for towers now, if we had to go out and do um, a study for every one, we would, we would never be, be getting anywhere. So we would review, we will review the study that um, Osgood has submitted for wind and if we find any discrepancies or have any questions we pose them back to them as part of our first round of comments. Okay, thank you. Uh, how do you justify uh, this design of this building um, uh, in terms of the existing character of the neighborhood um, when the material and design are completely different? So in terms of, of fitting in. Um, well, what you see in this proposal is a concept elevation that is sufficient in information to move it through the zoning and official plan amendment stages. As we move into the site plan approval, we get more into the design development. Um, and I guess a more careful review of existing conditions would be looked at, but we feel you know, the buildings, you know, the, the Amblewood area was designed at a certain period of time and the buildings reflect that and any new construction generally likes to reflect the period of its construction. So uh, we do take on, uh, we do look at sites like this. It's, it's a little different than working within a historical context. So we're, de we're dealing with a, uh, uh, you know, a new building that really should reflect the character and uh, of, of our times, so. Okay, thank you. Um, will the underground parking have EV stations? Yes. Okay. Someone asked about how many votes are needed. You're, uh, if you're asking at planning committee, um, there's currently 11 members, so majority would be six if uh, to defeat uh, the proposal. And if it got past that, it would have to go to council. There's 23 members of council. It would have to have 12 votes uh, to be defeated. Okay, I think these are repetitive. Um, in terms of the residents getting to say anything, um, Laurel will wrap up um, and talk about the process for speaking at the planning committee, which is where um, members of planning committee and other councillors, I always show up, um, get to ask questions and, um, and hear the concerns of the community. So um, she'll finish up with that. Okay, I'm looking to see if there's any more questions. Um, we haven't done yet. Okay, um, we've we touched upon um, designated um, affordable housing. You're talking about subsidized for low income earners. Um, we just talked about that. Um, and, and, uh, about traffic, we've already looked at that. Um, accessibility entrance on 1071 um, will be lost. How many people with disabilities will get in the building? 
So what is being done for accessibility is a good question. Me. Uh, I, sorry. That's um, part of um, the next generation of the program. We very much want to improve uh, access to the property um, on the north side. Um, and that'll be integrated into the final design proposals. Okay, thank you. Um, Don is asking about, um, about less abled person who travel on mobility scooters from New Orchard Avenue. Yes, um, that is something the city has to always keep at standard. Uh, we've had to do that with the LRT construction too, which has been challenging and uh, uh, the impact on safety. So that is, is always um, a priority. And I know I've, uh, I've discussed this with uh, the transportation people uh, when we've had concerns in the past about previous construction. Um, the proposals, um, how will the pressure on Ambleside and New Orchard be on, on visitor parking be dealt with? So um, do you feel you have adequate, I guess the question is, is do you have adequate visitor parking? Well, we have adequate visitor parking uh, at the existing building, 1071 Ambleside. And um, we believe there will be more than adequate parking at the, at the new building as well. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a resident of the current building. What accommodations are being made for current tenants of 1071? Um, who presently park in this impacted area once development commences? That's an excellent question and something that um, that um, we, we we're taking very, very seriously. One of the things we are talking about is building the parking deck in stages so that we don't have to um, move as many, uh, we don't have to move all of the tenants who are currently parking uh, outside at one point in time. Um, there are a number of indoor spots um, during the summer months that are not used. And there is the opportunity to create more um, uh, temporary parking at the front of the building during construction. Thank you. Um, uh, the proposed construction will also bar entrance to the only non-stair pyramid paramedic friendly entrance to 1071 Ambleside. How does Osgood plan to accommodate safety while the construction in the back parking lot is going on? Uh, I will have Rod correct me if I'm if, if this is not right, but my, my understanding is, is that we will continue uh, to have access during construction um, uh, at the north end of the building and the construction will be uh, properly fenced off uh, from that, yes. Yes, you're correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, the north end of New Orchard is a direct access path to the Riverside Pathways, um, including the only underpass um, below uh, to the S-Jam for safe crossing to the Riverside. This access point is very popular with cyclists, pedestrians, families. Will the new driveway access um, impact their safety? We don't, we don't believe so, no. Okay. I think it'll be a well-designed um, access point. So lots of, vis lots of visibility uh, coming up from below, so. Yeah. It, it's certainly a concern I have, Donna, in terms of, uh, I use that constantly. Uh, I, uh, so I, I understand your concern. And um, I think that's important that um, it be very safe uh, for, for all. It's also, by the way, going to be the access to the Britannia Winter Trails because the trails are going to come through that underpass. So people will go down there with skis as well, just so you know. I'm just looking for questions. Um, what is the uh, impact of, uh, of approving height request when other property owners also ask to exceed official plan heights? Will this be a precedent for any other properties in the area? That's for me. Yeah, that's for you, Laurel. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. Uh, no, it doesn't set a precedent. Each application is evaluated on its own merits. 
So we take a look at the actual application before us. And as I mentioned before, we evaluate it against city policies and guidelines. And it doesn't necessarily mean that one down, if one down the street was approved, that another application would be approved for the same reasons. Um, there might be different zoning. It might be a different designation under the official plan. And the context could be completely different than what is down the street. So um, I know we've talked a lot of, or uh, the proposal at 100 New Orchard has been brought up um, several times. That application has been on hold for um, a very long time. That's that's also my application and that might never come to fruition. So if um, this application here on Ambleside goes forward, it doesn't set a precedent for New Orchard or vice versa. Each one is evaluated um, on its own merits is what happens. Thank you. Okay, I'm just looking at the number of questions we have. Um, uh, it's hard to tell because some of them are statements. Um, uh, I'm gonna, say we'll go for another uh, 15 minutes if if everyone is okay I know I'm asking uh, for your time um, in terms of uh, um, everyone being here okay sorry every time I do this I lose my spot um, I know there was a question about being close to the water and water levels um, maybe answer that one So the geotechnical report would have looked at sort of the, what, what we've submitted currently is a preliminary geotechnical report based on the concept plan. But as the site plan gets more refined and they understand the, you know, the depth that they have to go down for to create the parking garage, do the shoring, the uh, soil engineer is on site and constantly monitoring stuff. So if things like water levels and water tables are a concern, they, they get addressed at the time of sort of construction and pre-construction as Rod and his team come up with the detailed drawings for the, the actual building. Okay, thank you. Um, do we know um, um, what the city uh, considers to be a maximum density for this neighborhood? It seems that this is a key question about development in the area. Um, that's a good question in terms of, um, I, I've been trying to figure that out as well. Um, if you're talking about, uh, we're talking about north of uh, Richmond Road um, with the, the buildings. Um, and um, I'm looking at uh, uh, what that, what the density is in this area and, and how this is reflected. But I don't have an answer at this point. Um, will the amenities in the existing building be restored or replaced, i.e. broken pools? Uh, we have no intention at the current time of, um, of restoring the existing pool. Okay, you're not going to uh, restore the existing pool? The, the, the pool has been out of service to, since 1987. Um, oh, okay, I didn't realize that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. So, what will happen? Um, we, we are we're studying various uh, various possibilities as to what we can do with that space. Okay. Okay. And uh, how much carbon will this building generate? I don't think that's a Steve question. Is there somebody else on your team who might have that? I uh, honestly, I, I I I have no idea. <laughs> okay. So, um, I Okay, uh, that would fit into an environmental study. So perhaps there's some information that would lead to that answer. Um, evacuation, evacuation plans, um, um, uh, because of, in the event that, the, that invasive construction uh, uh, would lead to catastrophic damage to 1071. Well, I, I think this is all part of, of building. Um, having uh, any kind of uh, a plan um, for the vacuum plans would be taken into consideration. Why is this being planned so close to the river? Um, I guess in terms of climate change and uh, climate emergency, is that a factor? Well, it is. <laughs> Sorry, I let you go, Rod. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say that um, while it is 
close to the edge of the property. It is um, well with, or it is within the zoning boundaries for how close the property can actually be to the edge of, of the river. That's, that's actually a criteria that the city has that um, it cannot be that close. And, and the NCC has its own rules too. So they have to be taken into consideration. The NCC will not allow you um, closer, even if it's on your own property. I know that. Um, how many stories is needed to make the project uh, viable um, with uh, sufficient year over year revenue? I don't, I don't think that's an appropriate uh, uh, question for, for this forum. Okay. Um, if approved, when would construction start and when would it finish? Uh, the, the process ahead of us is before building permits could even be contemplated would be 2023. Uh, um, I, I would, I think at the earliest, but it's really, uh, I think Osgood's got a lot of um, uh, soul searching to do uh, prior to um, sort of fixing the date. Right now, we're trying to get the policies in place and the zoning in place to allow, uh, to allow them to make a uh, informed decision. But I don't think uh, Mr. Greenberg has picked a construction date yet. So. Okay. And at this point, we don't even have a date for when it would go to committee. So, um, so obviously, um, it all works from approval, um, which uh, would be a major factor, and we don't have that date yet. Yes, I say after, after the approval, then would be the start of the design process for site plan. And then the site plan process is, as you know, another six to eight months uh, approval process. So um, you're looking at you know close to a year after it's gone through this this process. Okay, um, just looking to see if there's any other questions in terms of. Um, okay, is there an assess assessment of cumulative impact of all active and approved development projects um, on existing infrastructure, power grid, water supply, et cetera? The answer is yes, but I don't know if you need any elaboration on that. I can't answer questions about affordable housing because uh, that has not been decided or raised even. Uh, well, I raised it, but um, we have not got uh, that information at all since that has to be a discussion. Okay, I'm just looking through to see if we've got anything that hasn't been touched on. Okay, um, uh, I'm seeing uh, basically versions of, of, of previous um, questions. I, don't have to live there. Okay. I apologize. I'm just looking through, and uh, there's a lot of uh, information here. Okay, um, so we've already talked about car the car issue of the construction. Um, is the city looking at community? Uh, cumulative impact on services and other sites on Richmond Road in the area that that are more suitable for intensification. Um, when you talk about services, I'm not sure if you're talking about water services, hydro, electricity. Um, I 
think that we're we've answered that in terms of the uh, what the city looks at for all projects. Don't know if um, it's. Uh, Okay, um, I think we're still on the same idea. All right, at this point, um, I'm not seeing new questions. I'm seeing comments uh, back and forth. Uh, so um, I'm going to say at this point that uh, we've covered the main questions. Um, and um, if you feel your question has not been answered, um, please write to us and we'll, we'll send it to the appropriate person. And I think there's been very good questions. This is obviously a very emotional issue. And, um, and, uh, and that's why you came out, because um, you're concerned. Um, these, uh, this is your property. Most of you live in Ampleside One. And, uh, and I'm quite aware that you're, you're not happy about this. Um, and you've signed petitions, et cetera. Um, I'm trying to explain the process. And, um, and I know it's disappointing because uh, people feel that they have a direct impact and, and they do if they, uh, you know, in terms of, of what the process is, but uh, um, not in the way that uh, you've uh, you expected. So anyway, um, so yes, it's very clear how you how you feel. Um, so I'm just going to let um, Laurel do a wrap up because uh, she'll talk about uh, what the next steps are in terms of uh, of this process. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor. I just wanted to say that uh, I know there's been talk about two petitions that have been submitted and I have received them. And I understand there's hundreds of um, residents who have signed those. Um, I have not received nearly as many comments as hundreds and hundreds. And if these members, um, if these residents want to be contacted by the department, they have to contact me themselves. They have to send an email um, to floral.mccrate at ottawa.ca or write into the address at City Hall. Just because they signed this petition, is, it is not considered an official form of correspondence, unfortunately. So um, if the authors of the petition are on this phone call, um, organizers, I guess, um, please have those people contact me so that they can be informed accordingly. Um, if not, they'll just have to hear it through um, their neighbors and their friends because they will not be contacted by the city. So I just wanted to, to make that clear. And then, and the same goes for planning committee. They wouldn't be notified of planning committee as well as um, their appeal rights um, to the Ontario uh, Land Tribunal. If uh, the application is approved, there are appeal rights for members of the public, but if you have not contacted the city, then you're essentially waiving your rights. There was one question in the comment that I, in the chat there, that I wanted to address. Um, as many people can come to planning committee as they want to participate. So if you, you know, if, if 100 of you want to come and speak, 100 of you will be able to speak to planning committee. You're each allotted five minutes. If you don't feel comfortable speaking in front of planning committee, you're also welcome to write in and then all members of committee and council are showing your correspondence. Not everybody is comfortable in speaking um, through Zoom. So you are able to write in as well. So everybody and anybody is welcome to come to planning committee and uh, you'll be notified with the department's recommendation 10 days prior. If you haven't sent me your comments yet, um, we accept comments throughout the process. So please do, so as soon as possible that, so that I can include them in the summary and provide them back to Foten and Arkin. And if you have further questions for me, um, please contact me through email if we need to arrange a phone call, um, I'd be happy to do so. But try emailing me first since my phone is not exactly reliable right now while I'm working from home. Okay, thank Thanks. you, Laurel. Um, um, I appreciate everyone coming out um, and um, I know this has been very, very important to you. Um, this is part of the process to, to hear this and get as much information as, as you can. Um, 
and I, I hope that, um, that it was helpful. Um, it may not have been totally satisfactory for many of you, I understand that. Um, but uh, now you get a good picture uh, because you haven't had this before. This, uh, the developments you're living in were built over 40 years ago. Um, I don't think anyone saw this coming in terms of when you see the area, um, but um, part of it is about the intensification of this area. And yes, we will see more uh, intensification along Richmond Road, that was expected um, and, and that is coming. Um, there'll also be new commercial um, uh, 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 features on main floors of, of some of these places. So you're gonna see changes. Um, uh, I, I don't have anything concrete to tell you about those things right now, but that's part of it. And you know, you're gonna get a beautiful new station that's gonna be uh, in a very short walking distance which is why there's less parking at these, at these newer developments. Uh, not the same as years ago when 40 years ago it was considered normal for everybody to have cars. Well, less people are having cars. And when they move into this place, if they choose to move into this place and don't get a parking spot, they have to, they've made a decision and they're not going to drive. Um, and that's happening more and more. So, so that's part of the choices they make. And we've seen buildings, um, I've dealt with buildings that are at a 50% rate where only half the people get a parking spot. So, so that is, is uh, coming more and more. Um, um, frankly, um, your building with more parking spots being a condominium might uh, attract uh, certain people who do not want to give up their cars. So that will always be a feature, just, just saying. Anyway, uh, thanks ev to everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, thanks to the presenters, I appreciate your time. Um, thanks to city staff and uh, thanks to my staff as well for, for helping me out tonight. And uh, do take care. And uh, if you have any further questions, as, as we've said, um, as Laurel said, um, you can write directly to her, or you can write to my office and we will be putting this information up, including the, um, this, this meeting and uh, the presentations. Thanks very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Take care.